This is a Hot Pie Original. I'm going to go at this in reverse because there's a lot to the other part of it that, that should and will take a while. I'll talk about Joe Biden's compelling, interesting, my opinion, compelling, interesting, and honest speech yesterday afternoon that we all should have paid attention to. I'm not sure we did, but we should have. It was really a well-done speech that was ruined, of course, by his shockingly awful, terrible, disastrous, and incompetent plan to get out of Afghanistan. It was the first seven minutes were exactly what should have been said for the last 19 and a half years. And then you realize, as I'm watching and listening, like most of us should have, uh, it is an obligation here. This one's our war. But the first seven minutes are everything that should have been said repeatedly over the past 19 and a half years, only to realize, oh my gosh, buddy, what an absolute train wreck shockingly bad idea and the way we went about it to get out of there it was just a it's a bizarre scene it's a bizarre 24 hours but put that aside for just a second let's dump something else on us let's all try to take some ownership let's all try to accept some things that i think we have to as much as we pretend no as much as we don't care as much as we live a life where that's not me i don't worry about it now let's go back to tiktok Maybe his speech, maybe the criticism of the plan, maybe just the awareness once again of this unbelievable two decades, shockingly disastrous two decades, shockingly expensive two decades, shockingly confusing and just overwhelming 20 years in Afghanistan. Afghanistan to a lot of us, is our Vietnam. That's the way I've always thought about it. The appreciation some of us would have had for people that lived through Vietnam, and I say that the appreciation is the Vietnam generation cared. They cared. They paid attention. They cared. Agreed or disagreed. Mostly disagreed, but they cared. We're a generation that has had its Vietnam, and frankly, it doesn't look like we've cared. We haven't forced the issue. We haven't forced the conversation. We haven't pushed our political heroes and our taxpayer money. All we've done is let military go there and get their legs blown off. And we haven't cared and we haven't even paid attention for the most part. Now, you can agree or disagree with that, but I'd, I don't know any other way to summarize it for somebody of the uh, not in the Vietnam generation. This is our Vietnam. And unlike the Vietnam generation, we've gone about it a completely different way. And I don't think you can even dismiss it and say, well, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, is, it's over there. Well, Vietnam was over there and they cared. But we don't seem to care. We aren't connected. The Vietnam generation was connected. It was a way of life. It was a passionate time. We haven't been connected. We've avoided noticing. We've avoided talking. We've avoided protesting for almost two decades. We've even avoided, and I may have made the comment several times through the years, almost out of guilt. I think we should have guilty feelings about our disconnect to Afghanistan and Iraq. I think if somebody in the military said, you know, we ought to feel pretty guilty, you didn't care. I think they'd be right. I think we actually should feel pretty guilty. N not what you think the policy should have been or should be now, but the fact that we just didn't seem to care. We'd never forced the issue enough. Entire presidential elections have come and gone, and it's barely talked about. We don't vote on it. We'll vote on transgendered athletes more than we'd vote on being in or out of Afghanistan. So I think we, all should, we should all feel guilty. Now that the news is ugly, really, really ugly, just shockingly ugly, Maybe, maybe it's our obligation, again, to pay attention. I think it is. I think it is our obligation to care. So forcing the conversation, again, is a healthy thing. The one thing that I think we're uncomfortable with, since we now live in this world of every answer is right or wrong, there is no nuance to us. Certainly, politicians don't practice nuance. We don't practice nuance. It's either right or wrong, or I'm going to check out. Either I have an opinion, black or white, or I'm out. 
We have no tolerance for. This is a really, really complicated place, a complicated time. And there's a gray area. There's no good answer. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't care. Take a look at the presidents not named Trump. They age in dog years. Joe Biden aged, and he can't afford it, aged in dog years yesterday afternoon for pretty good reason. So I was going to dump this on you. Uh, I found this a really interesting read. It's something I've argued, and it just nobody seemed to care. Um, again, because we haven't really cared. Um, but this is a guy by the name of David Vine, a professor at American University in Washington, um, heads up some group called the War Project, where they sort of calculate costs of war. And it's whether you like it or not, it should be dumped back in your lap, because I think we also have a real issue staring us in the face. I would submit to you, I don't want to preach, but I think we have a moral issue now staring us in the face. Forget Joe Biden's shockingly incompetent plan to get out. I'm not saying the idea of getting out. The execution of the plan looked like something out of a bad movie yesterday. My gosh. But, but we, have a, we now have a moral dilemma staring us in the face. And I'm not sure. Maybe we'll do it again. Maybe we'll completely ignore them again. Follow this. Think about what is our obligation now. It is our money, our war, our soldiers, our bombs. I mean, it's all us. Our handprints are all over it. So what is our obligation now? And it's uh, something that I think everyone should think about. And I don't know that we will. It's, that will be interesting, too. He writes, imagine how it would feel to have to flee your home tonight, perhaps forever, running for your life from an insurgent army sweeping to power. This is what around 30,000 Afghans were experiencing each week during the Taliban's military advance through their country. Those now in flight, as well as nearly 6 million forced to flee their homes since 2001, are part of what the U.S.'s 20-year war has brought Afghanistan. Lives hanging in the balance. The question now is, what the United States owes the Afghan people? You want to say nothing? Back it up. You want to say something? Back it up. One important place to start is for the Biden administration to welcome Afghan refugees to the United States. That's the other thing that should be staring him and all of us in the face, and that is, what are we going to do after that train wreck yesterday? Even if it wasn't a train wreck yesterday to get out, you know, people falling from planes and stuff like that. What is our obligation? It's been our war. I'm not saying we were the bad guys. Afghanistan, the Afghanistan war has displaced at least 2.1 million Afghans as refugees and 3.9 million internally. Factoring in deaths from disease, hunger, and the destruction of health and other infrastructure, the death toll is likely at least 600 to 750,000 people. What would justice look like if another country invaded the United States and waged a war that displaced 50 million and killed and injured millions more? The United States does not bear all the responsibility for the destruction in Afghanistan. Responsibility also lies with U.S. allies and other militant groups and other foreign powers. Still, we bear overwhelming responsibility because of the Bush administration's plan to wage war in a country whose people had no role in the 9-11 attacks. In 1980, he points out, the United States admitted more than 350,000 refugees, including 125,000 Cubans. So, what do we do now? It goes on. It should be required reading for everyone. I mean, at some point, we should all have to pay attention. We should have to think it through. I mean, this has been our time. This has been our Vietnam. I and mean, we've really been disconnected and we really haven't paid attention. But now we've got this giant issue of do we feel a little guilty about what happened, what didn't work? And, all, you know, I'm not to armchair quarterback all the reasons why it didn't work, whatever it was supposed to do. But now that it didn't work and you had that ugly scene from yesterday and those poor people are trying to hang on to the wheels of an airplane to get out. What's our obligation? I mean, what is, what is our obligation now? And I guess you could say it's a moral obligation. You might say a financial obligation as well. I mean, what do we do to try to make, 
the last 20 years and certainly the last 26 hours any better. And I think he makes a pretty compelling argument that we've spent. You know how much we've spent? You know how much we've spent? $2.3 trillion on 20 years of war in Afghanistan. $20 trillion, $2.3 trillion in 20 years. That tops $700 billion annually and exceeds that of the next 11 countries combined. That's more than our military budget each year when you factor it in. What now? All right? I don't know that we have an answer to make it right. But what do we owe the people that have been displaced that don't want to be there, that don't want to be terrorized more, who don't want to die, who honestly have turned and said, and you'll hear a comment uh, later from a reporter at the Pentagon yesterday, she broke down. And it was so compelling and so tragic that everybody should have to hear it. But what do we owe the people that thought we were going to help out? And I'm not saying we didn't try. I, there's no perfect answer. But if they're turning around saying, I thought, I thought this was a deal. Now there's no deal. Is there an obligation? Is there a moral obligation? Is there a financial obligation? Whatever obligation you want to think about. And by the way, is there not an obligation to at least pay attention? John McClellan is the co-founder and creator of ATX Hot Sauce, now in all 50 states and several retail outlets as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to let this social media rock star chef uh, walk us through four different sauces, and then I'll taste, and we'll tell everyone why they should buy. You can give the science behind yeah. these, and then I'll make the uh, the simple recommendation. Go to atxhotsauce.com. All right, so let's go. I don't so think heard the website. Yeah, I know. I know. You, Jeff, <laughs> I've but never that, heard yeah, that. Yeah, it is atxhotsauce.com. I'll say 345 right. times, atxhotsauce.com. So let's do it. Uh, I brought four flavors here, and we're going to test your palate today. Okay. And I only brought four because I didn't think you could handle five yeah, or six. Yes, probably a smart move. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the first one we're going to try here it's called Beet Heat, and just like the name implies, beet. it beet it has beets in it. It's made with red Fresno peppers. Red Fresnos are uh, red peppers that are uh, they're hotter than a jalapeno and a little bit less than a serrano. So not super hot here. Uh, just a lot of good, really good flavor. So we're going to start All with right. this one, and then we're going to move up the chain. Okay. I've had the Beet Heat, but okay. Yeah, we're going to try it though. We're it goes try it well. Here. It goes well with a cab. All right, Jeff's savoring beet I'll heat. I'll even do it with you, so that should be all right. Now, remember, it is hot sauce. Yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's hot sauce. Trust me, man. Wait, it's that hot sauce. Is that one hot to you? Um, No, no, no. A little. Yeah. The, no. the great thing with the fermentation process is you get a bunch of the flavor right up front. Yeah. And then the heat comes, but then it dissipates pretty quickly, especially with the red Fresnos. You know, this is not a very spicy... Uh, one, but it is um, a very tasty one. Goes on great on sandwiches. Beet heat. Beet heat. B e e t heat. All right. Go to atxhotsauce.com. That's right. So, uh, I mean, surely, well, we hope most people have watched and listened and followed. It should be right there in your face, and it is. We're talking about Afghanistan again. It's ridiculous, honestly, that we ever stopped talking about Afghanistan. We've spent trillions of dollars and thousands of people have died. But, and I don't want to preach, but we should all feel really, really guilty for letting the issue go. We will probably let it go again in a month. I compared it for a lot of us. It is our Vietnam and during that time, it seemed that people were more connected to the story, were more connected to the contours, were connected to the aspects of war and all that comes with it. We haven't been connected. And I don't think it's okay to not be connected to this. Um, we shouldn't be fighting about vaccines. We shouldn't be fighting about gay marriage or not issues like transgendered athletes and stuff like that. We should have been protesting and fighting about what to do in Afghanistan, pro or con. Isn't that why we vote? Although it doesn't seem to be much of an issue. Hasn't been an issue. So the last 24 hours after two decades of war or policing or nation building or humanitarian rescues or all of the above, right? The last 24 hours has been nothing short 
of a bizarre and shockingly ill-prepared and incompetent plan. I guess. It sure looks like it. To be fair, there are people, there are members of Congress. Um, there's people listening or watching, I, I think, that might fit into this category that have consistently said we should stay. Those people have existed. They've existed in Congress. They've existed for some time. Um, I, I don't agree, never did agree. I remember the day that uh, Colin Powell and going into Iraq, I remember watching. I remember it was minutes before my show started. I watched and I watched and a lot of us admittedly were some of us are not military people. We don't know that much about the region, but we tried to pay attention, myself included. And I remember he had that pointer and he's pointed trucks or milk trucks or whatever was going on. And then I came on my show and I said, I don't know that I agree with this. And oh my gosh, I should have known it started a tidal wave of you hate America, you hate America, you hate America. I don't know. I don't know if it was a good idea. I never completely agreed. I don't get it. But maybe now people would say that's why we were there. Look at it now. But there have been people that have been consistent. I mean, the Dick Cheney's of the world, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, Hillary Clinton, Republicans and Democrats. I mean, Joe Biden is getting it from every direction, and that's okay. That's okay. He should be getting it from every direction. That's what the job entails. People should care. I think the criticism both directions is pretty healthy. I think his pushback is, frankly, kind of healthy, too. We're the ones that don't care. So we've some of us have disagreed with the plan or the idea all along. But if you take a look at the last several presidents not named Trump, they have aged in dog years for the very reason Joe Biden gave that speech yesterday. And it was Part of it was the most compelling stuff that he has done. Part of it was petty. And part of it was nonsensical chaos because the events were seemingly nonsensical chaos. So um, Joe Biden gave, I, I think I, you can agree or disagree. I think it was compelling. I think it was delivered perfectly. I think the first part of his speech when I listened to it, all I can think of was, I don't know why this speech is today. This should have been, in my opinion, should have been the speech of the last 19 and a half years. This is how we open things up yesterday. Again, there's no denying the guy feels the pressure. There's no denying he can't hide from the optics of that airplane and people falling off that plane and people trying to grab the wheels. He can't, he can't get away from that. And I'll give him some credit that he tried to own it. But he used the first part of his speech, a compelling speech, to justify getting out of there. And I agree with him. And I would have agreed with him 19 years ago. I just think it's interesting that he delivered that yesterday. Good afternoon. I want to speak today to the unfolding situation in Afghanistan. The developments that have taken place in the last week and the steps we're taking to address the rapidly evolving events. My national security team and I have been closely monitoring the situation on the ground in Afghanistan and moving quickly to execute the plans we had put in place to respond to every constituency, including and contingency, including the rapid collapse we're seeing now. I'll speak more in a moment about the specific steps we're taking. But I want to remind everyone how we got here and what America's interests are in Afghanistan. We went to Afghanistan almost 20 years ago with clear goals. Get those who attacked us on September 11, 2001, and make sure Al-Qaeda could not use Afghanistan as a base from which to attack us again. We did that. We severely degraded Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We never gave up the hunt for Osama bin Laden, and we got him. That was a decade ago. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation building. It was never supposed to be creating a unified, centralized democracy. Our only vital national interest in Afghanistan remains today what it has always been, preventing a terrorist attack on America's homeland. I've argued for many years that our mission should be narrowly focused on counterterrorism, not counterinsurgency or nation building. 
Yeah. Agreed. Wait. Maybe we should have. I mean, I don't think I could have been said any better. Again, if you agree, some of us agree. Some people have consistently over two decades disagreed. Some people would say, actually, now you see why you better get involved in nation building. And then, of course, the obvious comeback to that is, well, isn't that what we've been trying to do? And look, we didn't build anything. So I thought that was accurate, compelling, well said. I, I don't know that that is exactly what our policy was, though, to be honest. I mean, that may be what he thinks the policy should have been. I'm not sure that's what the policy was. One of the big criticisms most of us that have tried to pay attention through the years have had is we don't know exactly what the plan was. Was it nation building or was it exactly what he just said? If it's what he just said, and that's some of us agree with that, including someone named Trump. But then when you leave, look what happens. It was the right thing to say. It was the right thing to clarify. Was, is he covering his own butt a little bit? Of course he is. I just think that speech should have been given countless times, and it hasn't been. So then, um, no, argue, no argument whatsoever. Every decision is brutal. As Martin McKinnon said, the outcomes are always brutal. You're only trying to find answers that are less awful than the other than the other awful ideas. We're just trying to find the least awful situation. And maybe this turns out to be it. In fairness to Joe Biden, the look of the last 24 hours may be a distant memory. And maybe we're going to find ourselves in six months saying, yeah, it was the right call. It's the right way to do it. It was ugly that day. But, you know, so be it. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm in favor of getting out trillions of dollars and people dying and we don't know which direction it's going. I've always been in favor of not being there and getting out. So maybe more people are going to be forced to have that attitude. But then again, the pictures are going to be ugly. As George W. Bush has said now, he feels terrible for the people that are left there. Then that, of course, circles back to all of us. The people that are left there that thought life was going to be better, life is about to be awful again. What do we owe them? That's the next dilemma that Joe Biden has. All of us have. It is what it is. Now what? So then he goes on with the speech, and I think this thing started to digress, and I think it digressed pretty quickly, and I think it got, I think it got at times petty. We carry out this departure. We have made it clear to the Taliban if they attack our personnel or disrupt our operation, the U.S. presence will be swift and the response will be swift and forceful. We will defend our people with devastating force if necessary. I'm now the fourth American president to preside over a war in Afghanistan, two Democrats and two Republicans. I will not pass this responsibly on, responsibility on to a fifth president. I will not mislead the American people by claiming that just a little more time in Afghanistan will make all the difference. Nor will I shrink from my share of responsibility for where we are today and how we must move forward from here. I am president of the United States of America and the buck stops with me. I'm deeply saddened by the facts we now face. But I do not regret my decision to end America's war fighting in Afghanistan and maintain a laser focus on our counterterrorism missions there and other parts of the world. Our mission to degrade the terrorist threat of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and kill Osama bin Laden was a success. Our decades long effort to overcome centuries of history and permanently change and remake Afghanistan was not. One thing he we did. Made it one thing he did. I think we have the cut where he mentions Donald Trump, which I thought was just ridiculous. I, I don't think anybody should have a problem with the speech. I think he has to own it. I think somebody told him he had to own it. I have no problem with the guy looking the camera saying, hey, this is ugly and it's on me. And it's ugly. Man, it is, it is shockingly ugly. 
And I, I think a lot of us could be wrong. We have no appreciation for how difficult planning that would be. It just looked like there was no planning. For a guy that spent decades around the issue, for a guy that set in on some pretty intense planning, obviously, it just looked like it was get a plane and get out. I'm sure it wasn't, but he has to own how ugly and incompetent it looked to get out. But that said, I don't, I don't think anyone should have a problem with the guy owning it. I do have a problem with him mentioning Donald Trump. Or I was left with. I mean, on this serious day, and the guy, if you're going to take ownership, just take ownership. Look, Donald Trump is an intellectual, I was about to say midget, but you're not allowed to say midget anymore. He is of no intellectual capacity whatsoever. He is a buffoon. Move on, man. Move on. He doesn't matter. I know he'll take shots at you, but for the fact that you try to get some cover by mentioning Donald Trump's name, I think is lame. It didn't need to happen. It didn't need to be mentioned. He didn't need to go there. Only some jackass like Trump would go there. I think it was a bad 30 seconds for Joe Biden. When I came into office, I inherited a deal that President Trump negotiated with the Taliban. Under his agreement, U.S. forces would be out of Afghanistan by May 1, 2021, just a little over three months after I took office. U.S. forces had already drawn down during the Trump administration from roughly 15,500 American forces to 2,500 troops in country. And the Taliban was at its strongest militarily since 2001. The choice I had to make as your president was either to follow through on that agreement or be prepared to go back to fighting the Taliban in the middle of the spring fighting season. There would have been no ceasefire after May 1. There was no agreement protecting our forces after May 1. There was no status quo of stability without American casualties after. Okay, I, I, I don't know that anyone is denied. Again, I don't even know that that's all Trump's fault. I, I, I know he'll just make noise. I get that. I get that the details of what Joe Biden inherited or Donald Trump inherited or anybody inherited are, are rough and awful, and you're trying to make the best of it. I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem with him saying it on this day. I don't have a problem with the rest of his speech. That part I have a problem with. I think that was unnecessary. I think it reeked of being petty. It may be true, but say that a couple days from now. There's no way to mention Trump's name without it being a, a stick of dynamite. You know that. A stick of dynamite for those of us that thinks he's a buffoon, he is. An intellectual zero, he is. But also for other people to go, yeah, well, Fox News will get you now. I mean, I, just, I think it was an invitation at a time when Joe Biden had to do a couple things. One, most importantly, own the ugly look of people falling out of planes and whatever that was yesterday. Two, explain why we're doing what we're doing. And I think what he didn't do is part three, and maybe yesterday wasn't the time for that, is explain exactly what we're going to do now and how we're going to measure that and what we're going to do about the humanitarian crisis. There's that, those three parts to me, that's what all yesterday should have been, and he mostly did it. When he went to Trump land, which is that Pavlov's dog for a reaction for most of us, felt scapegoating. It felt sounded like, well, I got to pick up the mess for this guy, which is true. I just don't think it was the time to say it. Oh, that was a bad move. Uncool. Trump-like move. So, um, I, I don't know why it was so ugly. I don't know that we're ever going to get an answer how seemingly incompetent it looked. I don't know that answer. I don't even know if that's a fair way to look at it. It's just a visual that should stick with everybody. It's sticking to him. Then um, there was, because I, I, I'm, I think we all should be fascinated by it. We should be saddened. Uh, it is our Vietnam, so I've always felt that way. I think the history of what we did in financing rebels there, giving them cash to fight the Soviets was fascinating and controversial. And 
I don't know. We ever know the answer. There's never going to be one. So that whole day, I found myself just sort of glued to it. Then there was this moment. And this is why I think we now, Joe Biden has a tough pitch for a country that doesn't pay attention, that wants to turn our back and move to the next thing. We're really good at whatever's in front of our face, whatever controversy is in front of our face. So Afghanistan has not been in front of our face. Our, our relatives that are soldiers, of course, it's been a total nightmare. And the scars are felt forever. And I really think we ought to feel guilty about our inability to connect with what the military has been through, the thankless job. But we disconnect pretty quickly. We'll move on to the next thing. There was this moment, and I don't know how many people have seen this nor heard this. She is, it's a Pentagon briefing after Biden's speech. The Pentagon briefing was predictably chaos. There was no good answer. You know, they're trying, this guy is trying to explain away how it is that somehow yesterday didn't, wasn't as bad as it looked with people falling out of planes and stacked on top of each other and trying to grab onto the wings just to save themselves. So he's trying to explain this day away. He turns to a woman, a female reporter, who's Afghan. Thank you so much, John. As you know, I'm from Afghanistan and I'm, I'm very upset today because Afghan women didn't expect that overnight all the Taliban came. They took off my flag. This is my flag. And they put their flag. Everybody is uh, upset, especially women. And I forgot my question to me. What do you ask? Where is my president, former President Ghani? People expected that he bye bye with the people. And immediately he ran away. We don't know where is he. And we don't have a president. President Biden said that President Ghani, no. He has to fight uh, for us people. They have to uh, do everything and we were able to uh, financially help them. But we don't have any president. We don't have anything. Afghan people, they don't know what to do. A woman has a lot of achievement in Afghanistan. I had a lot of achievement. I, I left from the Taliban like 20 years ago. Now we go back to the first step again. Do you have any comment? We are our president. You should answer to Afghan people. Well, I obviously can't speak for uh, Ashraf Ghani or where he is or what his views are. I wouldn't do that. Um, but let me say with all respect that uh, that I understand, and we all understand, the the anxiety and the fear and the pain that you're feeling. It's it's clear and it's evident. And uh, nobody here at the Pentagon is uh, happy about the images that uh, we've seen uh, coming out uh, in the last few days. Thank you so much, John. She, for those who don't know, her mask is the Afghan flag. Um, and I can't really blame her. You know, the essentially handpicked president, she's saying something pretty obvious. One, you've taken my flag, and the awful people have now taken over that you said weren't going to take over. And by the way, the handpicked president, and I don't think it's irresponsible to say, and she didn't do it. I think she was just too upset. Uh, and I don't think John Kirby at the Pentagon, I mean, he had to shut his face and just listen. You could not interrupt her. That would have been a horrible move. But she was trying, and though she couldn't get a hold of herself, she was trying to say, and by, I mean, by the way, you handpicked him. He left. How come he got out so easily and he's not one of those people hanging onto a wheel of an airplane? Good point. The answer is, and we didn't answer her. I don't know that we have one. So that was, uh, if that also, like everything else, that two minute exchange should be required of everybody in this country. It only has 42,000 views. I'm assuming a Kardashian TikTok video has, you know, 42 million. But that two-minute exchange should be for everyone. From the Hot Pie Media Studios in Austin, Texas, it's the Jeff Ward Show. Listen at jeffwardshow.com.